If the world were to behave like it has behaved in every other major bubble, that's all it would take. If you look at uh, a 10-year smoothed average PE and a, a Schiller PE, you find that uh, there's a pretty decent spike in 1929, a much higher spike than that in 2000, and a slightly lower spike than that. Now, this is the approximately the second highest point, higher than 2020. And in each case, they, they back and fill, and they go back to, to more average level. Even if you allow for a moderate increase in the normal Schiller. Ben Inker and I, 30 years ago, um, he, he was my assistant at the time, a very good assistant. I've always enjoyed having smart people do the heavy lifting. And, and the project was, we know the market doesn't like inflation. Let's find other things that the market likes or doesn't. And let's explain on a coincident basis why the market sells high and low, okay? And I went on a trip and when I came back, he tried, you know, 27 variables, et cetera, et cetera and had a model with a very high correlation, and it stayed that way ever since. It turns out the market is a coincident of comfort. What makes the typical portfolio manager feel comfortable? Number one, inflation. it loves low inflation. Yeah. It hates high inflation. It likes 2% stable inflation. It does not like to see it bouncing around. It doesn't like to see it spike in the worst way. Okay. And it does not like to see it hanging around for multiple years. That's the most important. Secondly, it loves high profit margin. What a surprise. Now, what's in third, way, way down in third place is the stability of growth. The growth rate does not have a positive correlation with PE. The market is nervous about bursts of high growth. It doesn't like plus nine, minus two. GDP it would growth. rather have plus three, plus three, plus right. three than plus nine, minus two. It, it, likes, certainty. it likes certainty, stability, yeah. Quality. comfort. Growth. Comfort is the best description. Okay. okay, so you look at this model and it says 1929 should not have been a surprise. It had low inflation, high profit margins, wonderful profit margins, incidentally. And the growth rate was ticking along at a pretty high rate and it was stable. So heaven, it, it, the market called the Great Depression. Everything was bad. It got the nifty 50 right on the nose. It got the idea in the 70s that you'd be seven times earnings because terrible inflation, persistent terrible inflation, low margins the and wild variation. economic growth. Yeah, yeah. So it 6.8 times earnings was the trough. And the model called for almost exactly that. You think we'll ever see that again? 6.8 times earnings? I don't know, but let me just finish this first. So then it makes what you might call a major error for the first time in 2000. It says in 2000, wonderful profit margin, no inflation. You'll have the highest PE that you have ever seen. Yeah. Not bad directionally. Instead of 21 times in 1929, a new peak of 25 times will be. And it goes to 35. And that was not explained by anything we could see in history or then. It just happened. You could argue that that is the only really crazy psychological event up until then in American history. Okay. In, in the history of America. We got it 18 months later. It's back on trend. We got the setback. We got the housing bubble right. We got the wipeout right. And then it brings us to the second major deviation. Second major deviation starts in the second half of 21. Second half of 21, we have an inflation spike. Every time we've had an inflation spike in history, right. PEs have gone down, sometimes rapidly. This one Not this time. was a strong inflation spike. Bloody PEs went up, <laughs> creating a, a major gap where the model goes down and the market goes up and suddenly we've got a big gap. Then the market says, ah, after all, I'm not sure I believe the Fed and, and the beginning of 22 is the worst six months since 1939. <laughs> but the model is still going down because PE is, inflation is hanging around and uh, the model declined. So fast forward, what does it say today? It doesn't like the pattern of stickiness in the inflation. It doesn't like the profit margins, which in real terms have been coming down quite steadily now for over a year. They're down over 15% adjusted for inflation. And uh, the model calls for 16.8, which in the long term is still pretty high. But the actual market is 29. And on a Schiller, it's 29. So this I is a pretty handsome gap. And what this says is that is if the market responds to the same forces that it responded to over an entire 100 year period. Let's the about interesting the thing component. is it wasn't different in 2007 in the housing bubble. It wasn't different in 2009. It's only been different for a couple of years since inflation spike. Do we really feel the market is cool about inflation, that it will not get a moment of second second thoughts like it had at the beginning of 2022? 20,
Let's Maybe go. this is not yeah. going to be as neat. Just back up a few weeks and we reached this kind of honeymoon period once again, where everyone was confident we were going to have a soft, yeah, landing. soft landing. Now, 1929, 2000, 1974, the Nifty 50, every one of these, we were going to have a soft landing. Trust me, check the data. We were, <laughs> everything was going to work out it's fine. Always start soft. <laughs> it never does. If you want to look at the great bubbles and nothing but what you find is the most interesting distinction is one that is unique to them and nothing else. It never happened anywhere, any other time. And that is the leadership of the market going up, you know, 70, 80% in a year starts to go down as the blue chips continue up. Now, they had the ones going down have a beta of 1.5. They're meant to go up 50% more than the market. They can't even get the sign right. So in 1929, the S&P was kind enough to have a low priced index, was pure junk. Pure junk had been up 80% plus in 1928 and is dropping all the way through 1929. The day before the crash, it's down almost 40% before the crash. It is the great, I like to say, primal scream from the stock market ever up until then. Nothing like that happens again until 1972. In 1972, the S&P is up 70. The average big board stock is down 70. Hmm. That's not bad. I can't tell you the low priced index because rats discontinue. Okay, then nothing like that happens again until 2000. In 2000, we know what happened. They take out the growth stocks and they go down basically 50% before rally and the rest of the S&P goes up. Yeah. So in September, on or around the 30th, the S&P is the same as it was at the peak in March of 2000. Right. In the meantime, the growth stocks have gone down Nasdaq 50%. Nasdaq has gone down huge. Right. So the rest of the S&P, X, the super growth stock, has gone up about, we calculate, 13, 14, 15. So the same thing has happened. The high beta stocks have gone down, blue chips continue up. And it happened this time too, only the fourth time in history where going back to 2021, they take out my poor quantum scape, the biggest spec of the entire cycle, which we can discuss. You had a, you, you had a private investment in that and you couldn't believe the and valuation. We'll come, let's come yeah. back to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> Starting with QuantumScape and quickly going through Kathy Wood's portfolio and on through the meme stocks and everything, uh, there is an ugly, an ugly year following my waiting for the last time and, and lasted right through the end of December. Right. But that is exactly what it did in the other three bubbles. In other words, if you're predicting a bubble, you should be saying, and the characteristic of this decline will be this unique odd event where the super leaders with the highest betas go down as the last gasp of the blue chip. Up the they go. Chips follow, you're saying. Down they come, yeah. And okay. then the bubble will break. And the bubble broke for a while. Didn't. The biggest spec of the cycle is QuantumScape. <laughs> I'm, I invested in QuantumScape nine years. We were kind of lured into it by very good ad advisors who specialize in, in green investing. And I was so inspired by them that I wanted to make the biggest investment I'd ever made. It was so big, we decided we better not put it in the foundation because it looked imprudent. So it was the only thing that was in my name. <laughs> anyway, fast forward quite a few years and it comes as a SPAC, which is most unfortunate since I've then gone on record as saying they are so disgusting they should be illegal. They are licenses to steal for the organizers who really even to get involved in that have to be marginally ethical, shall we say. So then I find myself in the uncomfortable position that it's a SPAC. Secondly, it's on the market. Thirdly, it is having no trouble explaining that it's still four years away from having any sales. Four years from battery. sales. It's a brilliant research lab that finds itself in the market as a SPAC four years before having a product. So what happened? It's 10, four times my investment. Yeah, better than a kick in the pan. Two months later, it's 131. <laughs> At 131, <laughs> It is bigger than the market cap of General Motors. It oh, is God. bigger than Samsung, the it's like battery you're manufacturer. It's like worth at that point. You were richer than Bill Gates. And, uh, no, <laughs> but I that holding was worth 625 million. Oh my God. I wasn't allowed to get out That's for right. six months. That's right. And I was cross my heart and hope to die, saying to my troop, if I am right about what this market will turn out to be, VC will be a disaster. And this is the kind of stock that will sell between five and $10 a share. 5.1 last December. <laughs> Down from 131. Can't and it's that. so unique that the usual way of trying to hedge would end in tears. No. I gotta tell you how oh, it finishes please. though. Six months later, you it's 25. Yeah. It's 25. We sold practically all of it. 10 times our money would be worked out okay. Uh, Ramsey Ravenel, who runs our foundation, we had spent a few sexy hours spending the 500 million that slipped through our bank. I, I think the temptation to manipulate these major variables is, is overwhelming. 
uh, particularly done in the interest of saying the market can go up a lot. I, I have a, a long history of, of, okay. of dealing with this tendency over a few decades. And um, I get it. It's nice to be optimistic. And uh, given half a chance, the investment business, of course, has a commercial imperative. Absolutely has bullish. It doesn't make any sense to be anything else. It maximizes the return over the full cycle. And that's how they do it every time they're bullish. So right. you never expect a major investment house bearish. I've been here, done that, terminal paralysis, we used to call it. Everything looks ugly. I know how you feel. You feel paralyzed. It's not that you are deciding to do anything. You can't make decisions. And what you have to do is overcome that. You have to get a battle plan together. Even a half-baked one is a lot better than nothing. These are cheap prices. You haven't seen anything this cheap for 22 years. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. It will more or less guarantee that you do pretty well for the next seven years on our data. We had double digit on the S&P for yeah. seven years. This was a far cry from two years earlier. So put together a plan, take it to your committee if you're an institution and, and start investing your money. And actually, however fast you invest it, you can't, you can't be too aggressive in those situations because even if the market goes down another 25% in the next month, it doesn't matter. If you've been out of the market, you don't need the bottom. We're already a hero. How do you maintain your hero ship? It's getting in with a lot. Just the data. The data was obvious. Fair. We just did what was obvious. And just for the record, uh, the first time we ever got any publicity was the summer of 1982, which is the only other low that matters. That, that was the, the, the cycle low for 20 years. And the Wall Street letter, it was called, now defunct, but of course I have a copy. <laughs> and early July, it, it quotes me for the first time and it says, uh, we're close to an unprecedented rally in both the stock and the bond market and we are 100% invested. It, it says 80% in equities, 20% in long-term 30-year bonds. We had specialized products that, you know, lost money, didn't lose money, but the asset allocation grew, which was half our business. We lost half our business, half of half, in a, in a real hurry, two years and one quarter, much faster than I would have guessed. And and we lost it in a very ugly way. The clients hated it. Some of them treated us as if we were trying to lose the money. And the, and, and the reason is there is nothing more irritating than, you know, you're playing golf with your fellow pension fund guys and they're up 60% oh, yeah. and you're up 21. Who needs that? You know, that is pure pain. And people think you get sold, you get fired if you do badly in a bear market. That is nonsense. In a bear market, all the clients freeze and then eventually pick their way through the rubble. You get fired in bull market. If you lag a bull market, they yeah. are active. If you lag a bear market, they are paralyzed. Envy of the guys who are kicking there yeah. is, is a big, big driver. And, and also, we lost money so fast. Right. That was the, the constant chat around town. Oh, GMO have lost their way. Okay. They're not with the with the new Kool-Aid order of business. And uh, and no one came back. So as in nobody. So we made the right bets for the right reason, and we won. And we made a ton of money on a relative basis on the round trip. In real life, what happened is that I argued for this time is different. The four, five most dangerous time is never different. Okay. And I got into a lot of trouble from Jim Grant, who you know, no mm -hmm. doubt. He said I was, uh, um, I had given up my religion, an apostle, right, to value. And so I wrote him a snotty nose letter and we compromised by, he invited me to his conference at the end of 2017. And I took the side, this time is different, leading with basically, dude, find me something that is not, profit margins are different, PEs are 60% higher than they'd be for 100. Interest rates are lower than we've ever seen, da 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 They've been going down for 35 years. When did that ever happen? Never. Basically, everything was different. What he said, I can't remember because it is different. And it was different. In late 2018, I wrote a paper saying, brace yourself for a probable near-term melt-up. I was thinking, you know, we haven't seen really crazy behavior. And it was a head fake, but the really crazy behavior was only a little bit further up the road. So right. I was deep into thinking, despite what I'm accused of, and you can see it in my quarterly letters, including in their title, I was arguing it's different, it's more, it isn't a bubble yet. I debated the topic of we are in a bubble in 2016. I took the, no, it's not a bubble. And uh, the other side was, yes, it was a bubble. Um, so I, I, I was not looking. I was into this time is different. The surge that took place in late 2020. 20, um, finally had the characteristics that had been missing for the 10 years. This epic 10 years. The mania came out. As I have said many times, written many times, bubbles, it's not just about price. If you get price and it's boring, that is not a peak. 
you you've the got psychology. to see yeah, yeah. higher prices plus crazy behavior, which is unique that you have never seen anything quite that. And the NFTs qualify? Absolutely. Yes. Meme stocks qualify. Sure. Absolutely. QuantumScape is the biggest scale of any bubble in history. There was nothing that scale. Individual any company. individual stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Japan, yeah. real estate, is the mother and father of all bubbles, much bigger than their stock market, the mother and father of all stock bubbles. Right. Their real estate was over 10 times downtown Manhattan. And downtown Manhattan was very high priced. Downtown Tokyo, was over 10 times. So that's that's the biggest bubble, I think, in history, including the South Sea bubble. The stock market in Japan went to 65 times stated earnings. There was some cross-owner complexity, but it looked like an amazing, amazing bubble. I think everybody else is guilty of the usual crime of expecting a soft landing when it never comes, but it's always clear. Believing the Fed, who has never gotten one of these bubbles right, regardless of no. the fact they have involved several different feds, no. underestimating the time that it takes for some of these things to work through, particularly real estate. And I'm sympathetic on that one because real estate is a global bubble. It has driven house prices provably to multiples of family income all over the world. China, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, you tell me, 15 times, 20 times family income, Sydney, Adelaide. <laughs> Etc. Canada, the UK, London, London is now 10, Toronto's worth, etc. etc. No one can afford to buy a house. Yeah. No, no young kids coming out can buy a house. This is not a stable equilibrium. Furthermore, the mortgages have gone from three, which explains everything, seven, which explains nothing. And eventually the seven will start to explain quite a bit. But how long does it take? I mean, just think, the first reflex is, I can't move for God's sake. I can't afford to go from three to seven, sure. so I am going to stay, which means no houses are on the market, which means for the handful of people who have to move, they're actually in a bidding war. So real estate has never been about three month prediction. It works slowly, but surely. In the end, you pay more because you could afford to. In the end, you will pay less because you can't afford. House prices will come down in everywhere from Australia, mentioned that in Australia, it's World War III instantly. They are more optimistic than Americans and oh, they really? hate any idea that they're real but Jeremy, estate. Are they gonna come down, down by 10%, down by 30 or? 30 would be a pretty good guess. Now, let me get onto a quick subdivision that everyone has forgotten. In the 70s, 80s, 90s, we always stated everything inflation adjusted. Nobody is stating anything inflation adjusted. For example. Or, what, earnings? Anything. Okay. I am short the Russell 2, right? In 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 the foundation. The foundation is 75% early stage venture cap and 25% hedging it as best we can. Credit default swaps in, in case this thing really becomes nasty, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, which we can discuss. But a lot of short Russell 2000. What has Russell 2000 done? One year, it is down. Two years, it is down. Five years, it is down, adjusted for inflation. Yeah. Nobody is adjusted, adjusting for inflation. The S&P is 15% off its peak, at least, maybe 16 or 17, because people are not adjusting for inflation. We've had quite reasonable inflation in the 20 months since the S&P. So they can say, oh, it's only down five or 6%. Yeah. BS. And real dollars are the dollars that count. 